just about Chuck Novell when he's working with the Allman Brothers. The thing about Chuck is that he is always playing a melody. He's always playing a lyrical idea. And you really are hard pressed to find a guy who can play with the honky tonk R&B blues bass that he has, but also this incredibly melodic take on stuff. You just don't find it. Darlene. Good morning. I slept a little late last night. Must have been all that traveling we've been doing. Want some breakfast? Yes. All right. My very secret ingredient I don't like people to know about. It's bacon. How about a uh, frittata this morning, Miss Rose? That'd be great. All right. This kitchen used to end about right here. It was teeny tiny, and it must have been about, oh, 15 years or so ago, we uh, just took this whole section of the house off, and uh, we used our own wood, Charlene Plantation Pine, when I had the tour of the offices of Capricorn Records, the doors open and there's two gorgeous women. This black woman named Carolyn Brown that was Phil's assistant and my future wife-to-be, Rose Lane, white at the time, who was working for Frank. I was the first person you saw when you walked in the front door. Phil and Frank were so wild. You know, back then there were a lot of drugs involved and they couldn't remember you know, from hour to hour, what was really going on sometimes. Rose Lane had set up a, the first, uh, one of the very first uh, simulcasts in the country. They had 11 radio stations that we got to hook up across the United States to do live in New Orleans with the Allman Brothers Band. Some of the folks that knew Rose Lane said, listen, you gotta come down. You were responsible for setting this up. You gotta come to the show. So uh, some of the roadies drove her down in her car and she arrives there and we had a dinner that night for the band. I finally got up the courage to ask her out for a date and bottom line is we've been together ever since. Rose Lane says I have uh, job security here because on a place like this there's chores to be done, there's unexpected things that might happen. Uh, you get a weather event and then you, all of a sudden you gotta be picking up trees off the ground and sawing them up. Everybody likes Chuck. He's just a human being that you think doesn't exist anymore. He's the kind of guy that makes you feel bad about yourself. And you'd think it'd be the opposite. A guy like Chuck makes you feel great. Makes me feel bad because self-taught tree farmer, a beautiful musician, beautiful human being. When you look at the list of what he's got going on at any given moment, it makes you think, well, I laid on my ass till noon and then went in and did a couple of scenes and then went home and watched sports and went to bed.
see the male goose out there, so that means the female's nesting somewhere. There is no such thing as a day-to-day -day basis because Chuck and I are all over the place all the time. This is home base, and so I think that whenever we get here, it's like, oh. It's The Late Show with David Letterman. Sitting in with the band right over there, Chuck Lavelle, ladies and gentlemen. Chuck, nice to see you, buddy. Well, he's just this uh, rootsy guy from the South who came up uh, in the relatively early days of rock and roll, 60s, and has been at the top of his game all of these years, and he can play you know, in, in a session in Memphis, Tennessee, or Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and then he can play in front of 40,000 people with the Rolling Stones. And I have a feeling to him it's all the same. It's all music. One of my favorite musicians of all time is going to sit in and play with us tonight. Guy's albums I listen to, uh, listen to him play on everything for many, many years. Um, he was in a lot of ways a soundtrack of my youth. From everybody from the Almond Brothers to Rolling Stone, Mr. Chuck Lavelle is here on keyboard. Kick us off, Chuck. Feel like rain Yet a week before They all seem to say With the help of God True friends I've come to realize I still have Two strong legs and wings To make me fly So I ain't wasting time No more Cause time goes by like Hurricanes And faster things Band who's a pretty, pretty, you know, uh, confident bunch. And I did not exactly tell them for the first time he was going to sit in with us. One of my main lead guitar players used to be in the Black Crows, adores the Stones. And so it was funny to watch them fall all over their fucking selves at Chuck Lavelle walking on the stage. I mean, it was like the goddamn team had walked out. Much faster fame see these professional musicians, seasoned, played the arenas, played for everybody, just lay down their swords, you know, in, in front of each other. Hey, man. 
<laughs> How you doing, bud? Doing good. Beautiful morning to make biscuits at 5.30 in the morning. Is that what you were doing? That's what we've been doing today. We're rocking uh, and rolling here in the H&H. Well, I'm ready for one of them biscuits. Well, sounds good. We'll get y'all ready real quick. <laughs> we'll go sit down. Mama Louise, yes. Louise Hudson used to feed us when we were hungry and didn't have no money and she'd say, well, honey, you just come on in. You can pay me when you can or if you ain't got no money, just don't worry about it. We're going to feed you. Ain't nobody going to go hungry. We'd order and there was five or six of us and we'd order one plate of food and we'd split it up and we'd each, you know, split it up and Mama H caught us doing that and she, you know, I can't imitate her voice, but my goodness, you boys, you can't be eating like this. And she'd bring us all the She said, you guys hit the big time. You can pay me back later. And she'd bring us food. <laughs> and I love it. You know, she uh, used to charge you according to whether she liked you or not. You know, if somebody was aggressive or she didn't like, it'd be, okay, $10. And uh, if it was some of us, it'd be, well, two fifty. dollars <laughs> same, same dish, it didn't matter. Hey, Mama, it's Chuck. <laughs> How you doing, darling? Oh, I'm doing great. It's so good to see you. Rose Lane. Yeah. I'm so glad to catch you here. That's wonderful. Thank you. You take care. Okay. Great to see y'all. When I first started playing the piano, my mom played. Uh, she was not a professional or a teacher or anything, but she played for family enjoyment. We had a little uh, spinet piano in the house. And uh, you see, I was the baby of the family. Uh, my brother is 14 years my elder, and my sister is about five years older than me. So oftentimes it would be me and mom in the house. She would say things like, well, Chuck, what do you think it would sound like? If, uh, if there was a huge storm outside, you know, and I'd rumble down for the thunder and then do some lightning strikes up here. What do you think it would sound like if you hit a home run? She instilled that in me, and music has always been more about emotions and colors and feelings than it is about notes and chords. at the big house. Uh, it's now a museum for the Allman Brothers Band. You know, when I first came to Macon, the guys were living here, uh, most of them anyway. We used to come visit and have jam sessions here. And through all the years, uh, it has become a museum. There's a lot of memorabilia here from the Allman Brothers. So come on in, let's look. On our first trip to London, we played at Nebworth Park. Yeah. In, outside of London. It would have been 73, I think, Mahadishna right? Mahadishna Orchestra. Yeah. No one had been outside the United States. Yeah, it was our first trip. Here's a, a great one from Winterland. I love those Bill Graham posters. They were always so cool. This is what we used to call the Get Out of Jail Free Concert. It was a free concert for uh, the 
quality of life in Macon, Georgia, and we gave money to the jail, gave money to several different charities throughout the city. And if anybody got in trouble, we could just say, hey, don't forget we did this gig now. <laughs> I wanted to play with anybody that had anything to do with the Allman Brothers. I don't care who says they're the biggest Allman Brothers fan, they're wrong. I was. After Dwayne had had his tragic motorcycle accident in 1971, band went out as a five-piece with no replacement. Very gutsy thing to do. Well, I think all of us were wondering what was going to happen after Dwayne passed, you know, and uh, it was just a, a revelation. It was just, they picked up where and just went to a slightly different road and just as authentic and just as great. So they called in Chuck and all the Allman Brothers were sitting in Phil's office and Chuck comes in, you know, sweet little boy and everything. Caroline and I are going, okay, he's fixing to get a big boost in life. Being asked to join the Allman Brothers was like catapulting 20 steps above where I was before. You know, they were already popular. They had already had gold and platinum records with Fillmore East. Limousines, private planes, stadium shows. You know, 1973, we were playing RFK Stadium, JFK Stadium. Uh, uh, it was, you know, it was a big leap, a big leap. And I tried to keep my head screwed on straight. Chuck came in and man, it was a, I mean, it, it just lit the band up, you know. Uh, it's just what we needed. When Brothers and Sisters came out and Chuck was featured prominently on it, all of a sudden it was a little more sophisticated. They had dealt with the, the loss of Dwayne and Barry and moved on in a way that was really uh, amazing. He was such an obvious choice. After you hear him, you you, you would think because they've been they've always been known for having two guitars playing harmony together and stuff. And you would think, well, why didn't he put another guitar player in? But Chuck filled the bill totally and completely. He made up for anything that was missing by not having another guitar player. Unlike other bands, I would always write an uh, instrumental for the album, and I didn't have one for Brothers and Sisters. I said well, we don't need to do this on every record. And Walden said, you know, you know, you need to write an instrumental. Well, the history of the song is uh, Dickie was listening to Django Reinhardt, gypsy guitar player from the 30s uh, at his home. And he had a daughter at the time, a little toddler, Jessica, and he was watching her at play. And Django has these really bouncy rhythms, you know, so, Dickie sort of, uh, you know, puts that in the wheels and starts playing this rhythm guitar part. He played like what Dwayne would normally play, you know, on, on the Rhodes piano. Yeah, Jessica is, I think, Dickie Betts' masterpiece, but without Chuck's contribution to it, uh, it wouldn't have the impact that it had on all of us, you know, uh, Chuck just outdid himself on that one. That's, uh, that's one of his finest moments. I love this blue piano, way cool. And since we're here at the big house and the memories are flooding back, we'll do a little bit of this. Piano solo on Jessica is one of the greatest pieces of music I ever heard in my life. Because Chuck made, you have the song, Jessica, and then when it gets Chuck's turn, he plays another song within the song. This guy in school grabbed me and he said, and he's an older guy, and I don't know why he didn't know me, but he grabbed me and he said, hey man, you, need, you listen to shitty music. I need to play you something. And he, and he played me Jessica, and I changed my life. Brothers and Sisters is still to this day the biggest selling record that the Allman Brothers have ever had. And 73, 74, we're touring, playing these stadiums, it's fantastic. Jimmy Carter is elected governor of Georgia. He does very well for the state. Really cool guy, you know, he's got a persona, he's charismatic. And then one day we get, uh, we're recording Dickie Betts' solo record, Highway Call, first solo record. 
And we get notified that uh, Carter's going to come down. We expected, okay, he's going to come down and shake hands and take a picture and he'll be here for 20 minutes, right? Well, he comes in, we're recording, and he listens intently. We meet him and, you know, he starts asking really great questions about the state of the music business and stays for like two and a half hours. I was fascinated with it. Not only the first time I'd ever been in a recording studio and, and the Allman Brothers were on the way up. He decides to run for president and the brothers have been very successful. And I think this was the first year they had the thing where the government would match the funds that were raised otherwise. So what we did is we gave, we played these shows for him. And the thing was we'd raise $500,000 and then the government would have to match it. Lo and behold, he gets elected president, you know? And man, did he work for it. I don't know if people remember this, but he was getting two, three hours sleep a night, going from city to city, campaigning, uh, talking to people, listening to people. And that's one thing about Carter, he's a great listener. He's been here at Charlene. We've hunted a couple of times together. I, I visited uh, Charlene uh, Plantation and met Rose Lane, his wife. Uh, after we had lunch together before we went quail hunting, uh, Chuck went in and, and played the piano, and we all gathered around and listened to him uh, play a good song and, and, and so forth. So we, we've been friends for a long time. This meeting goes down during this turmoil with the almonds, and the only people that showed up were me and Jay and Lamar. And we kind of, we said, we know what's happening. You know, the band's breaking up. Uh, we can either go our separate ways, or maybe we can build on what we've started. So that's what we decided to do. And that was the birth of Sea Level. So I think it was 76 or 77 the record came out. It was just the name of the band, Sea Level. When we got the first Sea Level album, we thought it must be because, okay, we get it, Sea Level Chuck. See, we didn't know how you said Chuck's name. We just knew he was on the inside cover of Brothers and Sisters. My family has always pronounced my name Level. You know, my cousins are all Level, my sister is Judy Level, my brother is Billy Level. When I began to get a little bit of notoriety and do interviews with uh, radio stations and such, it was always, oh, we have Chuck Lavelle here, Chuck Lavelle, you know, and I finally, I actually preferred that pronunciation anyway. And then we found out it was Lavelle, and we were real happy about that, because Chuck Level doesn't sound as cool as Chuck Lavelle. The best opening gig was uh, opening for Sea Level at a place in Virginia Beach called the Rogues Gallery. When growing up here, playing the Rogues Gallery was sort of the Valhalla, it was the ideal. So we played the opening act thing and had to split right out and go play our gig. This was right down the road, just maybe 10 blocks down the road. We're playing away and all of a sudden I see Chuck Lavelle walk in, who was a guy I'd, I'd admired for a while, and he, he comes up to me and says, you motherfucker. So that was, I mean, what a beautiful moment for me. From that motherfucker moment, we became fast friends and exchanged numbers. And I went to visit him. My future wife at the time, Kathy Hornsby, and I went were on a trip down south. And uh, we stopped in Dry Branch, Georgia, spent the night with Chuck and Rose Lane, and just had a great time. Sea Level T-shirt from uh, our third record, which is called On the Edge. There's my old buddy Lamar Williams. Here's a uh, poster from a Sea Level show. There was a great club in Atlanta called the Moon Shadow Saloon. And you know, we had good success. I mean, we were selling 250, 300,000 records per. We did, I think, five records over that many years. And but by the time 1980 came, the wheels were falling off of that one as well, and uh, we all realized it was time to move on and do different things. Our producer, George DeCoulias, came in one day near the end of the record and said, we, we, we have Chuck Lavelle. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what do you mean? He's like, no, we, he's coming up to play on the session, you know? And I was just like, you have to be kidding, you know? I mean, even, Back then, it was like having a royal presence in the studio. The energy was unmistakable. It was like, wow, man, these 
these cats are, they're there, you know, they're, they're doing this from the heart. They want you on at least one, maybe two songs. I said, well, okay. So this is right before I'm leaving for a Stones rehearsal, I think, the next day. It took everything we were doing that, you know, that we felt was strong and the best, and it elevated it to another, uh, to another thing. And they said, oh man, that's great, you know, can you put an organ on it? Sure, sure, put some organ on it. Uh, you know what, we got another tune here. It might, might sound good if you did that. Okay, so do that. Get, think you put some organ on that too? <laughs> okay, I'll do it. So this goes on, the next thing I know, I'm on just about the whole record. I think I'm on seven or eight songs. I do also remember that it was a Saturday or Sunday and the regular office staff of the studio at the time, no one was manning the desks. And my father, when he was on ABC Paramount Records, he was a folk singer, and his guitar for all those years was a 1953 Martin D28. Uh, and I just always remember we were so excited, we were in the control room, we we're listening, and I just happened to, to open the door to go in the hallway, and this guy is like walking out of the front with that guitar and another guitar case. They were stealing them. And Chuck is there the whole time, you know, but, but we instantly like, you know, fight or flight. We jump and chase the guy. He drops the guitars right outside the door. We, but that happened that day too. The only, like one of the only times anyone tried to steal from us was the day Chuck came to the studio. My mom and dad were there and it was like, what a glamorous life. Somewhere around the age of 15, uh, the desire to be on a record came into play. Muscle Shoals, of course, was the big hot spot. I mean, those, you know, this is where the pros were. They were making records for Aretha Franklin, for Wilson Pickett, you know, Rolling Stones went there, Bob Dylan. Uh, you know, so many great artists started recording in Muscle Shoals. I think I hear Clarence Carter in the background. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, this door, I used to come here literally when I was 15 and 16 years old. It's such a small building and there's just not a lot of room to, to hang out in there. So, you know, I, there, there'd be a recording session going on and my friend Marlon Green uh, engineered quite a lot here and Marlon would say, well, just come and hang out. You know, you can sit in the parking lot or walk around or whatever. And then when we take a break, um, I'll see if I can get you in, you know. And so here's where I would be right here <laughs> waiting for that door to open. And when it would, I was scared to death, but you know, I, I, I wanted so badly to play on a record. And so I would go inside that door. Marlon would say, hey man, come on in, you know, and I'd see if I could sit at the piano or, or just meet somebody or anything I could do to be heard and hopefully get a little action. Let's see if it's open. <sighs> oh man. At the time, this was like a spaceship. <laughs> and now it, it's quite antiquated, but uh, it's still very functional, no doubt about that. The first record I played on was in Muscle Shoals. It wasn't at uh, Muscle Shoals Sound. It was a different studio. And it was for a guy named Freddie North, R&B singer. And I played uh, organ on this song called Don't Take Her, She's All I've Got. And it became a hit. You know, and I was 15 at the time. So that was cool, number one. I'm on a record. That was fantastic. You know, I could hold it in my hands and look at it, and it didn't have my name on it, but I knew I was on it. And it was played on the radio. Fascinating, you know, fantastic. So that just kind of set me off to say, that's, I need to be doing this. And what I realized was in Muscle Shoals, number one, I'm 15 years old, the older guys have the gigs. You know, there were some great players in Muscle Shoals. Uh, Barry Beckett. Uh, with the Swampers at the time, uh, Clayton Ivey, great player. Chuck, to me, is is really what I call a really conscientious player. I mean, he's really he's really meticulous about what he's playing. You know, what I'm saying a lot of people just I call them bangers. And that's not Chuck. Chuck, I mean, Chuck knows what he's going to play before he plays it. Now, as I understand it, this is the original piano that Barry Beckett played so often, it's a Yamaha, but they used to have it up against this wall with the, with the lid facing the wall, and then they would put blankets all over here so that you could isolate the piano. 
been a long time since I had my, my hands on this. Let's see. Here's one that the, uh, the Stones did it right here in this room. I didn't really record that much here. Uh, I did a little bit. As a matter of fact, this was uh, one of the records I did here. There's a short story that goes along with this, and the only time I had any kind of encounter with, uh, with Dwayne Allman was in this building. He had come in to work on this record, and he played a slide, acoustic slide on Please Be With Me, Scott Boyer song. And he was, had finished his session, and he had his guitar, and he was walking out the studio, I guess, to go catch a plane. And I had just come in. And so it was literally passing in the hall like this. And it was like, hey, man, how you doing? And that was the extent of it. Chuck was selected as the National Tree Farmer of the Year, and people just absolutely were attracted to Chuck. Not because he was a rolling stone or a rock star, but because you could tell here was a forest landowner who really cared about his forest, his neighbor's forest, the forest throughout the state of Georgia. And when you've got several million tree farmers that are active in the American tree farm system, um, to be selected one from all of those is quite an honor. It's very, very competitive. Uh, the first time Chuck was elected Georgia Tree Farmer of the Year, he didn't make it all the way to the, to the second round. But you know, he kept at it. Uh, the committee felt strongly that, that Chuck was uh, a great candidate. And so when, when he and, and Rosie were selected as the national winners, it was a culmination of several years of, of work by uh, the state committee to promote Chuck as a candidate for National Tree Farmer of the Year. I can't stand to see these trees that die on the stump, whether lightning strikes them or uh, they die naturally or something happens to them. Uh, I just can't stand to see them go to waste. You know, otherwise they just sit there and die. Now, hey, fair enough, the woodpeckers need to get one every now and then, so I can't get every single one that dies on me. But uh, I try to get the majority of them and have them sawn up at my brother-in-law Alton's mill. We've renovated our own home using our own lumber. Uh, we're about to build a, a cabin on a new piece of property that we're buying. And so it's going to great use, and there's a story behind it. You know, this is our wood, this is our lumber. Holy Moses, I have been removed. I have seen the specter he has been here too A distant cousin from down the line Brand the people who ain't my kind Holy Moses We built the pond. There was a little, little bitty pond there. And that was something that we built out. Yeah, riding around it is beautiful, isn't it? The water's so clear. I have been so it pumped up out of the earth. We pump it up. And so it has a lot of chalk because there's a lot of kaolin around here. So that's why it's aqua blue like that.
and Mac, Mac Rebenack, uh, Dr. John's real name, Mac had just recorded In the Right Place, the LP, and the hit was, of course, Right Place, Wrong Time. And so he needed a band, and he came to Macon, and it was suggested, well, you guys, you know, why don't y'all go audition for, for Dr. John? What Dr. John does, it's smart. He goes, yeah, I'm gonna go be me and put his character all over it, and then he can be as sloppy as he wants, because he's got Chuck there to make it all solid and strong. The first night, oh man, Mac was all over us. Man, you cats, y'all y'all ain't got this second line thing down, man. Y'all got a long ways to go. I don't know if this is gonna work out or not, you know. And I guess Mac wouldn't mind me telling this story. So, at the time, Mac was on the methadone program, and I think he was also probably copping on the streets. Now, I didn't know this, okay? I was totally unaware of the situation. All I knew was that I wanted a gig. After about the third day of rehearsal and audition, uh, I went to his hotel room. I said, I got to get to know this guy. And we're sitting there for a while, and eventually he says, hey, hey, man, I'll be, I'll be right back. And he goes to the bathroom. Well, you know, he's gone, like, forever. And I had no idea what he was doing, but that's what he was doing. And I look over to a table, and I see what looks like a book, you know, a notebook kind of thing. And the curiosity gets the best of me. And, you know, he's not here, so oh, there it is. Turned it over. Well, the first page, there's my name, the name of all the cats in the band, and there's all these voodoo symbols by our name. <laughs> oh, Lord, what is this? What have I gotten myself into? Chuck's a boogie guy, boogie-woogie player. He's a rock and roll player. And to do that like the crazy boogie-woogie masters, Mead Lux Lewis, Albert Ammons, uh, those, the, the guys from the 30s and 40s who did that, uh, it's a serious split-brain thing. You, you set up an, a, a pattern in the left hand. <laughs> very freely rhythmically in this in the right hand while this hopefully is very solid what I just played for you is about six months of work to try at least of, of hard work trying to develop that It's just doing it and doing it and doing it until you get comfortable. You have to learn how to crawl before you can walk, before you can run. where he's playing a bass line like an octave, you know, bass, bass line with one hand and all of this blue stuff with the other hand. It's, uh, it requires uh, a pretty amazing amount of independence. Yes, come on along, you can lose your lead down the road, down the road, down the road. It was time to do run around and our producers wanted to add some keyboard and so did we. 
And when they mentioned Chuck Lavelle, we were very excited. I was like, wow, that guy? Yeah, I've, I've listened to him growing up all my life. Let's get him. And he showed up and it was exactly as we thought. You know, uh, he just sailed right through it. When you say Chuck Lavelle, it's like, um, I don't know, being in Nam and hearing the choppers coming. It's, it's a reassuring feeling. It's, uh, you know that it's going to be good. We've never done the song as well since. Brendan O'Brien had become this mega producer for these grunge bands out of um, Seattle and Portland and that area. And uh, he had engineered the Black Crows record and gone on to be this famous producer. And so he had uh, come across the band Train. And he calls me up and he says, hey man, are you in town? I said, what are you, we're in town. And he said, are you at home? I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm in Atlanta and I've got this band Train that I'm producing and they have a song that the record company believes is a big hit. And there's a significant piano part on it. And Brendan's a great musician. He said, you know, I could do it but I'd feel more comfortable if I had somebody I could depend on like you. And I said, sure, yeah, I'll do that. You know, I mean, you know, really just watching Chuck in that room behind glass playing a piano and just kind of looking around like, that was easy, you know? And uh, he just played it one time, you know, we probably asked him to play it a couple more just for fun, but he's like a guy who listens to it and it takes him one time. Well, look at what he did with Drops of Jupiter, and which is a wonderful song, a wonderful record, but without that piano. It turned out really, really well. It's a lovely song, uh, Drops of Jupiter. A player like Chuck can, can make or break a recording. He could be the most important person in the room, but he makes everybody feel like they belong there with him. Uh, Chuck's that kind of guy. I think it shows in the kind of person that he is in the first five minutes you meet him. I knew about his playing before I met him, and then in all these decades since, he's just shown himself to be an exemplary human being as well as a musician. It doesn't surprise me that he would take the time to really nurture his relationships and and thank goodness, as he says, he, he got lucky and picked the right person and she picked the right guy. But it takes a lot of work in this business. We did a little movie that nobody ever saw called Jane Mansfield's Car down in Georgia. And Chuck couldn't believe it. He kept thanking me and, oh, I can't believe you're putting me in a scene with Robert Duvall. He had a couple of lines of Duvall, you know, in a barber shop. Goddamn taste guy. A whole damn bunch of Yankees. Got nothing running through their veins but Cincinnati blood from Ohio. They're from Ohio. You ought to have to be from here to run for, for office the way I see it. Well, they've been here some 40 odd years, I can't. I don't give a shit. He doesn't freeze up, but he doesn't show off. You know, he's a rare animal. I, I think he's a. He may be, if there's a rock and roll unicorn, it's probably Chuck. <laughs> 81, Rose Lane inherits uh, this thousand acres from her grandmother. The phone's not really ringing for session work. Uh, I'm a little despondent about that, but at the same time, I'm interested in, in this land thing, you know, and I've started on this journey learning about it and was really fascinated with it. And I come home one day, kind of venting to Rose Lane saying, you know, I'm always gonna play music, but phone's not really ringing that much. Um, this trio I'm with is okay, but it's not really going anywhere. Capricorn had pretty much folded there by that time. So that, that went out the back door. And um, Bill Graham's office called, and it was this guy, Mick Double. And he um, said, was Chuck there? And I said, no, he's not here for the moment, you know. But he says, well, Bill wanted to have um, an audition for Chuck with the, with the Rolling Stones. So Chuck comes in, he's, you know, kind of downtrodden a little bit because he's not, life isn't going the way he wanted it to. He said, I'm just going to not do my piano, I'm just going to have a farm, we're going to live out here on the farm, everything's going to be great. And I'm like going, not, no, we're not really, it's not going to be like that. 
at the end of all this, she looks at me and she says, well, that's really interesting, Chuck, but guess what? The Rolling Stones called you today. And he told me that wasn't funny, that that was a joke I was playing on him just because he was depressed. And I said, no, there's the phone number. Um, you might want to call Bill Graham's office and see. So the next morning, he was on a plane. And the Almonds were like his favorite band, you know. And then he came back home, and he he was sat down in the chair, and he just started crying, you know. He really, he said, I didn't get the job. Stu calls me, and he says, uh, Chuck, the guys love you. They, they, you know, you did great, but they're going to stay with Ian McLagan. McLagan had done the previous tour. And... The summer of 82 tour, they hired Chuck to play. That was a life changer, yeah, it really was. And I loved Bill, you know, back in the day with the Allman Brothers Band. Uh, we had so many good times. He was very helpful to me with Sea Level. We did a lot of concerts for Bill. And he was just this incredible personality, charismatic, loved music, and a great businessman. You know, he kind of forged the way for the music business, especially live music business. All right, guys, I come bearing gifts here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank man. You very, very much. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Let me get a picture, sure. Come on. Thanks a lot. See you guys tomorrow, right? Yeah. Let's go to, uh, let's try Trocadero. The first time um, I came to Paris, was in 1982 with the Stones and we played the Stade de France and uh, Rosalind couldn't be with me because she was giving birth. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to be here when you're giving birth somewhere else. But, uh, no, but it was 82 and then came back in 83 uh, to record the undercover record and uh, we're here for, gosh, two and a half, three months or something. And then again in 85, recording the Dirty Work record. And then I think there was a gap until we toured again in 1990 with the Steel Wheels tour and we came here. It's not that he wasn't already in bands bigger than at that time. It was just a lifetime statement. The Rolling Stones were actually created by a keyboard player, by a piano player called Ian Stewart. And he's the one that put us together. To join this band, I mean, I had to in 1960. Uh, you have to pass Stu's recommendation. And if Stu didn't like you, you wouldn't be in the band. Well, Stu used to be a man of his own. He was cut from his own cloth. I mean, he very, he, he wouldn't really accept any outside of the inn. You know, because he was the man who played piano his way. He did respect Chuck, yeah. The main thing about Chuck and the Stones and how this has all happened is that Chuck's history of where he came from, where he started, who he played with, is quite amazing. It's like the southern royalty of, of musicianship. Chuck Lavelle sort of melted into the band. It wasn't so much a sort of joining or, you know, that obvious, like, click, click, click. Uh, suddenly, there was Chuck. Guys like Keith Richards um, and the Rolling Stones, all of them as a band, show other artists what it's like to transcend your surroundings at all times and float through the universe being on some other level, uh, which is really what you aspire to as a musician, is some sort of, you want to get to the medicine man level. And Keith Richards is like full on medicine man level. Keith Richards could smoke in a hospital. That's what I say. And someone would say, oh, sorry, Mr. Richards, continue. And Chuck is around that, knows that he has a place in that. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody in a room you know, with me play the kind of boogie-woogie piano that he plays, man. He's amazing at that. He's doing stuff with the bass line that 
with one hand that, you know, I don't know if I can do with two. I think the whole thing with the Allman Brothers, they were about jamming in their, in their playing, in their music. They, they didn't write things down. Um, and the Stones were exactly the same. So um, I think this also was good for Chuck because Chuck was used to that. I mean, the Stones is, is a band that, okay, we do obviously play a lot of the same songs. The rehearsals, and I said, guys, you know, last time I was with you on tour, same set every night. You got this incredible body of work. You got new songs. We got to dig, let's dig deep. And I began at that time taking uh, copious amounts of notes. I had a, a notebook and they're simple songs basically, but I wanted to chart them out. So I made uh, chord charts for them just to, you know, have in my mind uh, where the bridge was, where the solos were, was there horns, was there background vocals, whatever. Which I kind of go, where's the book, where's the book? Chuck, you must have this one. I remember doing this with, and he says, that was eight years ago. I said, yeah, but you must have got the notes. Come on, we're going to start from scratch. So we, we're, Chuck and I go through the book of all the arrangements of how we did this song. And he keeps amazing notes about what key we did each song in and what city, what nights. It's like, a, it's like his Bible, you know? He's like the gatekeeper. I mean, I know that sounds like nothing much maybe but to me it's really important because i otherwise every time you do a song you start from scratch about how you did it eventually they've given me the moniker of uh, musical director i kind of scoff at that because mick and keith are the musical directors but you know they they look to me from time to time to remind them what the arrangements might be chuck is maneuvering through all of that giving them structure without them feeling tethered and that's a gift. As musicians, we, ha we have the ability, in a way, to become family with people right away. And Chuck has that also, you know, sort of very warm and welcoming feeling about him as a person. I think if you go through Chuck LaBelle's discography, look at all the records that he's played on, it would be difficult to match that accomplishment, to find any musician who contributed more than Chuck LaBelle. He's a... Uh, Indispensable, you know, is an indispensable part of our setup. What's always impressed me about Chuck is that he has this whole other life outside, outside music, with his with his forestry and his environmental issues, and you know, it's it's extremely impressive that somebody who has come so far in this very specific world of music has another has another life and is and is contributing something to to society and ecology and the environment and giving talks at the, at the White House. I think the trees is really a good thing he does. He's obviously very sincere about it. He goes all over the world and, you know, it's not just about the trees in Georgia. I think it's a really, really good thing. Uh, I try not to rib him. Maybe I'll rib him once, okay. Thank you. <laughs> but I think it's really good work and it's nice to have something outside of music as well. Every uh, plane trip we go on, and people are asleep or having beers, and Chuck's there, typing away. Um, he's, you know, he's a good, he's a good multitasker. He's a great emailer and a great um, campaigner for the forest, which can't be bad. He's not just good for, you know, for playing piano. Chuck is good for the environment. You know, he's trying to, he's trying to help save our planet. No, I'm not bored by that at all. We need more like him. It's about his heart. It really comes through his fingers, it really does. And to make that connection is a, is a, a blessed thing. They're just super cute, man. They, they are, um, they're, they're total, they're just a total team. They're so cool that you, you don't think of, of the, the time that they've been together. They really seem like they, you know, they could, they could easily have been together for three months, you know. They're, they're just very steady and, and um, really fun to hang out with. Trocadero, honey. 
How many times have we been here? Like many, many, 15 many. or 20 or something? Absolutely. Fantastic. We got to get a selfie, right? Yeah. Hold on. All right. We got it. You want this one? How much is it? <laughs> I, don't I don't know how much money I am. Yeah, just look at that. See, it's something multicolored. Okay. <laughs> look at it change colors. Yeah, change color. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, no, we t we'll take this. It's a bonus. I'm broke now, you know this. <laughs> Come on. One of the uh, very interesting things about Paris is that while it's known as the city of lights, uh, it's actually also the city of trees. There's over 470,000 trees in Paris and they are all documented. This looks like a uh, piano stool. Yeah. <laughs> and so now I am Le Capitaine. So I call him. Gonna do a song for you. Beautiful, isn't it? Wow. And we had the lovely little boat and went up and down the Seine and turned around and come back up and down. Gotcha. Beautiful day. and music director Chuck Lavelle sitting in with the roof tonight. Chuck, we love you, buddy. Welcome back. Oh, we get to see you, buddy. Thanks, Chuck is also the co-founder of the leading environmental website, Mother Nature Network. I believe in this stuff. I believe in climate change. I believe we got to make these changes in our attitudes towards the environment. And our staff and my partner, Joel, whom I love so much, uh, everyone at MNN just does a, a, a wonderful job because they believe in it too. You know, it's in their DNA, it's in their blood. They want to see these changes come about. They want to offer the general public 
options to live better, to be kinder to the planet. And I'm just as proud as I can be of all of our staff. We at Mother Nature Network always went much broader than energy and recycling. We always had travel and food and family. You know, the site had rapidly became and still is by far the most visited site in the world uh, for profit in the environmental category. We get people from 200 different countries, close to uh, seven million a month. You know, they, they just love what they do and they believe in making a change. And that works for me. He is as knowledgeable on the topic as anybody. I mean, he can discuss the chemistry and, uh, and, and geology and all of the very academic aspects of the topic with experts and in an expert way. When you think about it, okay, trees and forests, well, they give us materials for books, magazines, newspapers, packaging products. They give us materials to build our homes. They provide clean air, clean water. They provide home and shelter to all manner of wildlife. And you know, I love the saying that Ralph Waldo Emerson has. His quote was, in the woods we return to reason and faith. What does that mean to you? Oh man, it's so true, you know. Um, uh, it helps keep me balanced. You know, when you uh, live in a world it can get pretty crazy from time to time. And you take that walk in the woods and see some deer dancing through there, you know, see a wild turkey, a covey of quail, songbirds, uh, black bear, we have black bear here. And just, you know, hear the sound of the wind in the pines. That's a good thing. Prescribed burning can be one of the best tools used in certain forests. You have to know what you're doing. You have to do it right. You have to do it at the right time. You have to understand all the dynamics involved. But it can be such a positive outcome. Uh, what does it do? You're reducing competition against those mature trees so that the sunlight, the water, uh, goes more to the trees that you want on that landscape rather than scrubby oaks and uh, undesirable growth that is in the understory of the forest. It also helps reduce the incident of wildfire. You're getting rid of the fuel that might build up over years and then when that wildfire hits, boom, you lose everything. One early memory on the farm I have of my dad, he loves his burns and he just loves burning and he said he definitely set a couple things on fire in a bad way, um, learning how to do that. But I remember he would set his burns and we would go out and ride at dusk and check out, you know, how everything was looking and just the beauty of seeing those little fires, they're low, you know, less than a foot. And then growing into becoming really an expert, winning Tree Farmer of the Year, you know, nationally and starting to speak about conservation and becoming extremely knowledgeable to the point that he can you know, school other people on that has been interesting to watch over the last 35 years. You know, we're seeing what's happened out in California and the West with all of these fires. And if they had the opportunity to do an occasional prescribed burn, I don't think you'd be seeing nearly the devastation that you are seeing these days. The most important thing you're going to do when you're going to initiate a prescribed burn is to cut a fire break all the way around the area that you want to burn. So, you know, in, in, in Charlene Plantation, I have a, what's called an offset harrow. Uh, it, it's basically kind of a plow, and you go around the area with this to make the dirt pop up and to get rid of any grasses or, or you know, items, sticks, whatever, that might cause a uh, uh, fire to get out. And uh, you make a nice wide fire break, um, and that's the first thing you do to keep the fire where you want it to be and not let it jump out. When you make a little country album, 
And you have Frank Liddell and he calls Chuck Liddell and you get a taste of that absolute rock and roll royalty on your record. It's it's a treat. And definitely also for Pistol Annie's. I mean, he's played on almost every one of my records and the Annie's records. And, you know, it's funny that on a lot of the music that we listen to on a day-to-day basis that we love that inspires us so much, he was on that and now he's on our own records. I have this fantastic picture of uh, us in 89 on Steel Wheels Tour. We played Legion Field in Birmingham, Alabama. I sent a car down for mom and her friend. I took her to the concert and I have this fabulous picture just before we walked on stage with mom and her friend and the whole band. And, you know, mom sitting on her purse looking up at Mick. <laughs> That's fantastic. Hello, everyone. How fantastic that you are inducting Chuck into the Alabama Music Hall of Fame. Sorry you couldn't be with you tonight. And it's our fault, really. We want to say that Chuck is just the most amazing keyboard player and he's very worthy of this great honor you've given him. Yes, and Diamond Tiaras and Neil Chuck will know what I mean. Greetings from South America. He's here with us now. Sends his love. Congratulations, Chuck! Well, I can tell you this, that at the present time, uh, I'm seeing the third severe drought on Charlene Plantation. You know, there's really nothing you can do to uh, prevent this. This is nature at work. You know, these bugs have always been here throughout the eons of time. They're usually kept in check by cold and wet weather, but with climate change as it is, you're seeing more and more uh, hot weather. Uh, we set records every year now here in Georgia. This year we set a record of the most days above 90 degrees. And when you're getting that much heat throughout the summertime and throughout even the fall, it just creates a situation where these bugs can thrive. And if you hit that drought like we've had here, this is what happens. I mean, there's no way to come in here and spray anything. There's nothing to spray, no, no chemical you would want to use uh, to spray this anyway. So there's basically three insects that you worry about here in the South. There's the Ips beetle, I-P-S, Ips. There's black gum turpentine beetle. And then the worst guy is the Southern pine beetle. The speed of these bugs kind of depends on the exact uh, bug we're talking about. A southern pine beetle, in the proper conditions, you know, they can eat up probably an acre a day or better. Um, the ips and the black gum turpentine are going to be a little slower, and you can tell that by these little small things that look like popcorn, these little white specks on the tree, uh, which is... Uh, crumbling now, but it was full of sap at one time. And so what are we going to do? Well, <laughs> you try to make uh, lemonade out of lemons is what you try to do. First of all, you, you need to arrest this. You want it to stop. I've walked around this a good bit and we had a lot of wind during that period of time as well. And what happens is these bugs literally get blown from one area to another. My best guess is that I've got about 12 acres here that's going to have to be wiped out. If there's uh, good news about it, uh, the lemonade is that a lot of these trees are perfect size to make fence posts, and that's a pretty desirable product. So 
I've already talked to my forester and my logger and we're gonna take all of this and get as many fist fence posts um, out of it as we can. The rest of it might go a little bit for pulp wood and some of it just has to be chipped up for energy. This is real, it's happening. We need to do something about it. You see what's happening at the uh, Amazon basin with the forest fires there in recent times. There have been thousands of fires. That is the lungs of the planet. We lose that, you know, it, it, it's like contracting cancer. Just, you know, a great guy. I can shout, I can scream, breathe it out, breathe it in. All this love from within. For me, uh, it's really a love story. Yeah, uh, 40, 46 years now we've been together. And uh, whew, that girl's been mighty good to me. <laughs> we have a very special thing. Farming and just all that just brought him to be who he is, really, the Chuck LaBelle, the, not the musician. It's the Chuck LaBelle, the man. It's amazing to me that he can live that kind of life and be in that kind of place and then go play for the Rolling Stones and you know, play for a million people you know, in South America. What I mean, it's, it's nuts. Mom and Dad both were, were great at old sayings. You know, Mom would say, stitching time saves nine. Dad would say, well, you make your own luck, you know. That one always stuck with me. You make your own luck. What does that mean? It means learning how to be in the right place at the right time. The story of my career has, has been very fortunate to one thing leads to another. And so in 1989, we're on tour with uh, the Stones, Steel Wheels. The band decides to have a special guest. Well, they call Eric Clapton. And he did several shows with us. Being Eric Clapton, uh, the band said, well, let's do a blues song. So we did uh, Little Red Rooster, Howlin' Wolf. I am the little red rooster, you know, Mick sings it so great. And so we have a nice musical conversation, you know. I, I, I'm being careful. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. This is Eric Clapton over here, right? It was that play, playing with, with Chuck at that point that made me realize that, that it was a real thing. I actually needed something credible to play with. I get home and on my cassette, there's this unbelievable message. Hello. This is Eric Clapton calling from Hong Kong, wondering if Chuck Lavelle might be interested in doing some dates at the Royal Albert Hall. Yes, I would. I would be very interested in that. I would be extremely interested in that. And so, you know, I answered the call and we hadn't long been finished with the uh, Steel Wheels tour and I think it was 91. We did 24 nights at the Albert Hall. I played 18 of those 24 nights with him. One of the most soulful white musicians I ever came across, partly because I guess he was steeped in it from where he came from. But he was kind of like Mr. Natural, and, uh, and he, was very, he was always positive. He was always positive and very supportive. The tragedy is that Eric was going to take a year off after uh, the Albert Hall shows and after doing this work. <clears throat> and he wanted to spend time with his son, Connor. And uh, we all know what happened. You know, there was this horrible, tragic accident where Connor falls out of a high-rise building in New York. Well, I'll tell you something. When <clears throat> I'd been sober for about four years when my son died, and uh, there was a lot of talk about whether I would that would be, um, that's what I was going to, I was going to pick up, you know, I was going to pick up. So 
after the obvious period of grief and trying to figure that out, he decided, hey, I need to work. You know, I don't need to take any time off. And so he had challenged George Harrison kind of to a tour. You know, was, hey, man, you, you make a record every five years or so, but you don't get in the trenches like we do, you know. But I don't have a band. I don't have a band. Eric says, well, I've got a band, and you can have it, and you can have me. So there we go. You know, we work up this tour with George, last tour that he did, tour of Japan. Eric Clapton and band uh, backing him up. Man, wow, what an opportunity. When I uh, was hanging out with him early on and found out that he had played with George Harrison, that was kind of the topper for me. Like, that was the one where I was like, okay, got to tell me everything about that gig, you know. So we spent, we spent a couple of nights um, recounting George Harrison stories. Some of us in the band tried so hard to get George to take it to the U.S. And, you know, Eric was doing George a favor, obviously, and I don't think Eric was interested in continuing that. And the next thing we did was the Unplugged record. It had been going for a while, Unplugged, uh, and a few people had... Um I'd use that format in a, in, in a fairly successful way, but to, it, what I'd seen up up till almost that point uh, was people just doing their recorded material in a, in an acoustic setting, and I thought, well, that's interesting and all well and good. But then I saw Hall and Oates do it, and they did a Beatles song called "Don't, don't Let Me Down." I think it's a Lennon song. And I twigged. I finally thought, I mean, I, I realized what you could do. And I thought, well, OK, I can do renditions. This has got nothing to do with me playing my own material. I can do, I can do other things. And Alberta was one of them because it was one of my favorite songs. And, and it's always been a challenge to me to take a solo performance and turn it into a band arrangement. I think it's the most challenging and interesting and satisfying thing about making music. And so that was my first show as the only keyboard player with Eric. Chuck is a very sentimental guy and I think he, he likes things with emotion. section feel with with delicacy you know that was an incredible um, incredible way of being almost not there you know but just shift the thing on because he swings like crazy you know that's it, um, that's not easy you know that's that's a gift really we had rehearsed the song old love right and I thought it sounded great, but Eric said, well, I think maybe he felt like it was, uh, you know, one ballad too many, or he, for whatever reason, he decided he didn't want it in the set. And I was disappointed, but okay. So we go through the set, the whole show, we play the encore. I think there was a couple of, couple of encores. Audience wanted more, the band's feeling great, everything's going, and I don't know why he turned to me, but he did, and he said, what can we do? I said, do, do old love, man. And, and uh, that was one of the greatest moments of the night.
Oh, no. Anytime you needed to know whether or not it was going well, I could look at Chuck and I knew we were doing all right, you know. He would feed that thing to you. To contribute to that and stand out, but not in a, an aggressive way. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to focus on Chuck, you're going to have a lot of reward. But if he's playing with other uh, famous musicians, then you can, you can certainly focus on them, and Chuck will only be adding to what they're doing. So it's a gift that he has that, that he, could, he, could, he could stand out even more if he wanted to. Uh, he's a great solo artist in his own right, but he can play with almost anyone and make them better, and that's not easy. You can look at being a keyboard player as two things. You can look at it as accompaniment, or you can look at it as co-creation, co-composition. And he is one of those players, you know, Chick Corea is like that too, you know. I mean, I can't think of many players outside of those two, where they're listening to what you're doing, and they're interacting in real time, and they are almost producing their part. They're not just hammering away. They're consciously listening to what the lyric is in your song, what you're going for, whether or not you've hit it yet, and they kind of sit next to you on the trip to find what's there. And I mean, listening back to these, even jams, quote unquote, you know, that we were writing stuff or coming up with stuff, you listen back to it and you end up humming the Chuck Lavelle parts, you know. You give Chuck Lavelle a hundred solos on the same song and all 100 of them are hummable. On the Born and Raised sessions that we did with Don Was, Don brought Chuck in and those were writing sessions a lot of that time. Some of it was stuff I already had, but a lot of that was freeform, like writing in the studio. Just to watch the process that he has, um, it's kind of a on-the-fly deal. He, he'll come up with a riff, and it's sound, sounding great, and then he'll start mumbling or, you know, coming up with nothing and then something. And before you know it, this guy has this great song written. It's just a fantastic process to watch. He's, he's a genius. Well, Queen of California was on the Born and Raised record, and uh, John wanted to do a video for it. We thought, well, that's a generous thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, he'd love to be in your video, man. So he flies us out to California. Huge, huge uh, studio. One of the biggest indoor facilities I've ever seen. And there's this incredible setup uh, they're going to do a long shoot all the way through the song. Starts with John in a bedroom playing his guitar. Uh, he walks out of the bedroom into another set, into another set. He eventually comes into a room where us musicians are stationed and, you know, plays with the musicians. It was one of the most fascinating videos I've ever done in my life. He is the rarest combination of honky-tonk, southern, rollicking R&B. He will sip wine, but play like he's drunk on whiskey. <laughs> Thinking about coming out with like a Gimme Shelter or something like the second half? Yeah. And just leaving you in. Yeah. Just come out, stay out. Well, Jack Daniels is in that set, Mixed okay. Drinks is in that set. Okay. We'll do Honky Talk Women or something with Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just stay all the way through the end. We'll do loadout. Okay. You gonna do the you gonna do the loadout? Let's do loadout now, because I know you've got a little customized version of it. Yeah, I just kind of do it to me. Uh, do you do you want me to play on the intro with yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me. Let me try that one. Oh. Very last section.
section where it hangs on the G to C, right? That one four, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, can we just do that part? Yeah. Oh, okay. My brother-in-law, he said my dad is like the Forrest Gump of classic rock. And it is. It's like if you look at like every seminal moment in classic rock history, Chuck Lavelle was there. My dad was being awarded the highest honor for the Captain Planet Foundation. It was also Ted Turner's last public appearance. And he was performing with um, Julian Lennon. Obviously, I've seen the Stones a few times over the years, but it was such pleasure. I mean, he and I clicked immediately, a great deal of respect for each other, and, uh, but, you know, it was actually fun on stage. It's one thing I found, I learned about Chuck when we are on tour, is that if you're in a hotel which has a piano in the bar, if you get a few drinks inside him, he basically becomes Little Richard. So uh, other than mixing and, and editing, what have we been doing? Living life to the fullest, I hope. Yeah, just been lounging on the farm. Yeah, Doing great. a bit of woodwork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll show you. Oh. This, is, um, this is made out of a tree, out of my, my woods, that, that died, if I can find it. Oh wow, that is beautiful. It's a cherry, a cherry wood bench. It's not bad, is it? <laughs> no, that's beautiful, man. That is really beautiful. I think there's about 7,000 trees we planted here. When we planted them, they're about as thick as my little finger and about maybe 18 inches tall, just little twigs stabbed into the ground. And here, 20 years later, some of them are sort of 25, 30 feet high, some trunks, you know, 14 inches, 15 inches thick. But it's amazing to see the way trees just take off. After they've been in the ground three or four years, they suddenly feel their strength and they really start growing. When I was 16, 17, my folks took me to London to, um, to try and work out what I should do as a career. And I saw a guy for about an hour, and he, um, at the end of an hour of me waffling and saying nothing very much, he uh, told me that he thought that what I should go into was forestry. And here I am, years and years later, planting trees. Seems nuts, doesn't it? Sometimes you just know with someone that you're going to get on with that person and that he's going to share some attitudes and things and I mean I already knew about his playing. I don't like to be too um, prescriptive on how people are going to play things so I want to get them to express themselves, to have their take on what they do first, in particularly in the rehearsal sort of situation, and then see what from that is going to really work live. The 
but who you get to sing the other part in Comfortably Numb is always a problem. In the past, I've often had guests in to do one night when I can get um, interesting people. You know, David Bowie did the part at uh, the Albert Hall. Hey man, you want to sing on this? And I thought, no, uh, sing unison or harmony or something. Sure. He said, okay, well you do the uh, you do the counterpart. When Chuck rehearsed comfortably numb yeah. rehearsal, we were aware of, of, of his like his, um, his his playing. We were aware of his yes. musicianship. But then but suddenly, no clue like, about his vocal. When he started singing, we were like, I'm sorry, what? Right. What? It's um completely different type of version to the way Roger did it originally on the record and to the way other people have done it. And he said, uh, let me give you a tip. Curl your lip a little bit when you sing your part. You know, meaning snarl, snarl it out a little bit. You know, make it with attitude. And that was good advice. say he was a, he's done it about as the best of anyone that I've had doing I would want to impress on somebody that you've got you've got the real thing there and something so special that you'd probably miss it if you met him in passing you know one of the top five guys doing that sort of thing that he's been doing wearing all these different hats uh, in the history of the music, which I guess you could say starts arguably in the early or mid-50s. So that's a long time, that's 60-some years, and, and he's, uh, like I say, in the pantheon. Chuck, old Southern buddy, you done it. You're the best. He's a great piano player and a great, you know, collaborator and a, a really good friend. So I think I'm very proud to work with him. And I don't know many other keyboard players as, as done like Chuck's done, and that says a lot for Chuck, to me. I'm so proud of you, uh, honored to have worked with you. Um, I love you, and I will See you at the next one. It would be lovely to play with you again, man, whenever we get the opportunity. And, uh, and I missed you. I've missed you. So I send you lots of love and look forward to the next time. Chuck is more rock and roll than trashing a hotel room will ever be because it comes from love, it comes from appreciation, it comes from respect, and it also comes from when it's time to play. It's like, Look out, I got this. Um, he's a very special human being, he really is. Chuck Lavelle, Georgia loves you, the world loves you because you're so authentic, a genuine Southern gentleman who loves the land, loves its people, and I have been honored to know you and be in your presence, and you helped me keep Georgia on my mind. Georgia. Oh, Georgia. The whole day through. It's just an old sweet song we have a great partnership rosie and i you know we look Georgia after each other very much so 46 years you know and we're stronger than we've ever been well, georgia mm, georgia it's just a song Comes as sweet and clear 
There's moonlight through the pines Oh, the arms Reach out to me Oh, the eyes Smile tenderly Still in peaceful dreams I see I see the road leads back to you Oh, Georgia My sweet Georgia No peace I find It's just an old sweet song Keeps you rolling on my mind To me sometime other eyes smile tenderly still and peaceful dreams you know I see hey I see the road it leads right back to you man's a gentleman. The man's a real man. You know, and I don't think I can say anything better about any guy in the world. You get me?
Got to roll, roll.